At this time, both of our speakers will each have an opportunity to give a 15-minute rebuttal. And so up first will be Dr. Guyverson. You'll have 15 minutes for your rebuttal. We thank you, uh, Randy, for that presentation. Uh, I want to make a few uh, comments, which will be maybe a bit uh, disorganized here because I've just got to go through uh, some various things that he said. But I want to uh, zero in on a few places where I think that uh, he has misrepresented the way that, uh, that scientists would approach uh, the problem of origins. Uh, it's a very ingenious debating trick to sort of capture the debate by capturing the vocabulary and the definitions. And if we want to define science as something based on observation, testing, and repetition, and eliminate everything that doesn't fit that definition from science, then there are a lot of things that people are being paid to do as professional scientists now uh, that somehow mysteriously fall outside uh, of science. There does not exist a simple boundary between science as practiced by doing observation, testing, and repetition, which is a very important uh, part of science, and science which is done by examining historical episodes. Those two scientific enterprises are actually indistinguishable from each other. I'll give you a very uh, simple example. I mean, when, when you observe the sun, you're actually observing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So are you doing origin science and studying the past history of the sun, or are you studying the sun? Uh, in fact, if you look at the hand in front of your face, there's a small gap between the time that the light leaves your hand and it hits your eye, uh, and you are looking back in time a bit. If we go through the universe, we find many interesting things that take us way back in history. We find that when we look at the nearest star system, uh, Alpha Centauri, it took several years for the light to reach us from Alpha Centauri. So are we studying that uh, in terms of something which we are observing in the present, or are we studying the history uh, of that? Uh, in 1572, Tycho Brahe saw a brand new star in the heavens. It was so bright that it was visible during the day. Now we now know that he saw a supernova, a star that exploded and became so incredibly bright uh, that it was just mystifying uh, to him. Now this was an event which happened millions of years ago. In 1604, Kepler saw a supernova, another event that happened millions of years ago. In 1987, in the southern hemisphere, another supernova was visible. Now supernovas are very rare. Those are the uh, only three that we've had in the last 600 years that you could see from the, north, from, uh, from the Earth. Now, uh, those are unique events. Nobody can build a laboratory to repeat supernovas. Nobody can observe enough of them to say that we are doing repetitive observations on the same phenomena. And yet we have a very well-developed science of supernovas, and when the supernova in 1987 occurred, uh, many, many uh, theoretical ideas that had been developed based on uh, predictions that come from the study of, uh, of particle physics uh, were tested and borne out and validated by the uh, flux of odd particles that stream toward and through the Earth uh, in the wake of that supernova. So uh, when we look back into the past, we do science in exactly the same way that we do uh, in the present. It's just that you can't go back into the past and repeat things. I mean, we can't go back and change the Big Bang into something different and see uh, how things uh, will turn out. We have to e extrapolate based uh, on theory. We can't go back and recreate our solar system and put the Earth in a slightly different spot uh, to see what would happen there. But that doesn't mean that we can't study those things uh, scientifically. Uh, many things that are of great inter interest to us, like volcanoes today, uh, for example. I mean, continental drift is something that occurs. I mean, there's so many things going on on our planet that we cannot create laboratories uh, to test them. So uh, to restrict science to the investigation of things which can be observed, tested, and repeated is 
to try to place evolution and the Big Bang and the other scientific theories of origins outside history uh, by definition. And I am unaware of any member of the scientific community who would define science in that uh, particular way. Now, a second concern I have about uh, Dr. Glues' presentation uh, is his odd uh, identification of Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton and others as important Christian theologians. Now, these, these are men who want Christianity to go away and to die. And they would like, especially uh, Lewinton and Dawkins, uh, they would like to turn science into a weapon to make Christianity die faster and sooner. So it is in their interests to put a theological interpretation on everything that we know about science that makes that science incompatible with Christianity. So I want to suggest that we should not let these anti-religious uh, atheists uh, do our Christian theology for us. Uh, we should look instead to genuine Christian theologians who are not looking to science to destroy faith, but looking to science as a way to gain a more thorough understanding of God uh, as creator. In uh, my book, Oracles of Science, uh, my co-author and I looked at this tendency of leading culture warriors in the uh, battle for atheism uh, and how they like to sort of fashion science into a philosophical weapon to be used against uh, belief in God and against uh, Christianity in particular. And uh, in all cases, they extrapolate recklessly beyond what the scientific data can support. And uh, in so doing, they become uh, amateur, poorly informed, and I think uh, unhelpful theologians that uh, should be ignored. There is a lot of discussion in this conversation about the so-called uh, normal meaning of Genesis. And I just want to make a couple of comments about how the normal meaning of Genesis might not be as simple a concept as we might think. I mean, as Christians, we grow up reading the Bible uh, in English, and without thinking too hard about where it came from, we kind of read it as if it was kind of written sort of for us in our time. We kind of imagine that the language can easily be converted from Hebrew into English and the meaning uh, will stay the same and we won't uh, get confused and so on. Um, but if we look very, very closely at the Genesis account, I, I think we see a lot of things in there that uh, suggest to us that the normal meaning of Genesis uh, may not be what comes so quickly off the page in English translations. So take, for instance, the majestic open, opening line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when I was a youngster reading that verse, I had seen episodes of Star Trek and so on, and so I pictured the earth as this nice planet and the heavens as the place where the enterprise was boldly going, where no one had gone before, uh, and so on, and I thought God created that. Now, the Hebrew terms, however, for the heavens and the earth uh, are actually the exact same terms for the land and the sky. Now, we often think of a handful of dirt as being a handful of earth, and so we still have that meaning. But there is no way that the opening verse in Genesis can possibly be referring to a planet. Nobody thought of the Earth as a planet until the 17th century. A, a planet, and this is the literal meaning of the word, is a wandering star. A planet is an object in the heavens moving in an inexplicable and curious way that we can't understand. And the ancient Greeks wondered about the odd motion of Mars and Venus and Jupiter, and they called them wandering stars because they didn't move with the rest 
of the heavenly host. The earth was not a planet because the earth was not in the heavens and was not wandering about. It was fixed and at the center. So uh, to picture the proud round earth with its beautiful blue character and fluffy white clouds suspended in space as the meaning of the first verse in Genesis is to sort of rip that ancient Hebrew concept out of the time in which it was uh, written uh, and put it in a uh, context uh, several thousand years later, uh, which is, I think, a, uh, a very unreasonable disservice uh, to that ancient text. If we read a little bit further in Genesis, we see that God creates a firmament. Now, this word firmament has caused a lot of puzzlement. Now, it turns out that the word that's translated as firmament uh, actually means literally a bowl or a dome. And there are other places in the Old Testament where it talks about a firmament full of oil. Firmament, you know, you can buy, put salad in a firmament. The Hebrew word is rakia, and it means something that can be pounded out into a thin, solid metal shape. And we know from pictures that have come down to us and extra biblical accounts that this was the view that the uh, ancient Israelites had of the heavens. And they weren't the only ones. Their neighbors shared this view. I mean, everybody thought that there was some kind of an inverted dome overhead. And if you go to a planetarium, I had my students in the planetarium in Boston just a week ago, you can see that if you put a dome over your head and you shine lights on it, it looks exactly like the night sky. So there's a very ordinary, everyday observational language being used there that God has placed lights on this dome in the heavens uh, and that's what we see when we look up uh, at night. There are additional clues in the Hebrew meaning of the starring characters in this story, Adam and Eve. I mean, we know people that have these names today, so we just think of them as regular, ordinary names, but uh, I mean, the Hebrew word uh, for Adam is just man. God created man. It's a completely generic term. No one would have been called Adam then. And Eve is, means the mother of all living, right? So there, there are suggestions here uh, that this is, is a much different kind of story than something which we might get from the normal reading. And I think if we are fair to biblical scholars who have taken the time to help us understand what this means, uh, we recognize that there's a diversity of interpretation here that I think certainly should prevent us from digging in our heels on any uh, particular uh, interpretation uh, of this. Now, uh, I want to suggest that a much better approach to this, rather than suggesting that we must choose between God's truth or man's word, is to use a metaphor that the Christian tradition has used for a thousand years, even longer perhaps, and that is the idea of the two books. Okay, God has given us the book of Scripture, and God has given us the book of nature. Now those have been understood by Christians, going back to Thomas Aquinas and earlier, as two distinct and separate revelations, both provided by the same Creator, and both that can be brought into harmony with each other. Now, when they're not in harmony, we have work to do. And perhaps the most uh, celebrated historical episode was the one that challenged Galileo, when Galileo had to deal with the fact that it says in Psalm 93 that the earth is fixed and it cannot be moved. The earth is fixed and it cannot be moved. And Galileo was trying to convince people that the earth was not fixed and it did move. And so a question arose as how we bring these two books together. Well, we cannot bring them together by subordinating one book to the other. We have to keep them in conversation with each other, aware that they both have the same author, and seek humbly, prayerfully, and in communion with each other the very best understanding of both of those books so that we can better understand uh, our Creator. Thank you.